Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. Please note that the second homework is due this Friday at April 17th, 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So in the last lecture, we left it off at linearity and time invariance. The annotations for the lecture, for last lecture, actually go a little bit beyond uh, the actual video lecture. This is because I looked at the video lecture from last week I realized that it was getting too long and too dense and figured that I would just cut the video off. So the annotations that we're going to talk about today are the same ones uh, from last week with a little bit of overlap. Okay. So in that spirit, we're going to first review what a system is. A system is something that transforms an input signal x of t into an output signal. Systems like signals are functions. The only difference is that their inputs and outputs are signals themselves. And so in this class, as we mentioned, we would be talking frequently about SISO systems, single input, single output systems. In the last lecture, we showed that systems had properties. And two properties that we really emphasized were linearity and time invariance. So linearity and time invariance uh, are two properties that you should be comfortable in being able to prove. So just as a recap, I'm going to write down five examples of systems. And it'll be your exercise to see if they are linear and time invariant. So here's the first example. Let's say that y of t, y of t is equal to the square root of x of t. So y of t equals the square root of x of t. Okay, so this is a system, and your goal will be to answer is this system linear? Is this system time invariant. Okay. The second system is y of t is equal to x of t times z of t. Okay. In this case, assume that z of t is known and non-zero. The third system, y of t equals x a of t. The fourth system, y of t, x of t minus tau. And the fifth system, y of t equals x of tau minus t. So for these five systems, as a check your understanding, please go ahead and try to analyze whether these five systems are linear and or time invariant. Feel free to pause the video and rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So, those of you who wrote this, you should have gotten the answers. y of t equals the square root of x of t. You can see that because of the power here, because this is to the power of 1 half, you can immediately say that this is probably not a linear system. So the answer here is no. But of course, you want to be able to show this analytically. The second example here, uh, y of t equals x of t times some z of t, the dependence of the system's output on x of t is indeed linear. And you'll actually see if you go through it with these elementary forms for x, you know, x is not put to a power in any of these questions. So for all of these, you can actually say that these are all actually linear systems. And one way to prove this, remember analytically, is to actually go and see if the linearity expression that we derived in the last class holds. So you can kind of look at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equality and show that they're equal. For these systems, you also may want to analyze is this time invariant. So if you look at this, the first system here is actually indeed time invariant. Okay. You can kind of see that based on the expression that if I go and shift y of t, if I shift the input x of t by some amount tau, it's a tantamount to shifting the output y of t by that same amount. This is not true for the next example. 
So it is not true for the next example. And in fact, it is not true for the example after that too. So here is the answers to this question. Feel free at home to see if you got the same results. Okay, now although linearity and time invariance are the two kind of big properties of systems that you really should be familiar with, uh, there are other properties like memory that we'll talk about. Memory is this quality of a system. It tells you if a system depends on the past or future values of the input, right? If the output of the system only depends on the present values of the input, then it doesn't have any memory. It's memoryless. So for example, let's just jump right into uh, a concrete example. Let's say AM radio, right? We had AM radio from the last class, which took the form of Y of T equals X of T times cosine omega sub C times T, right? So this is the AM radio where omega sub C is the carrier frequency. And you can ask yourself whether this has memory or not. As it turns out, if you look at this equation, the output y of t only depends on the value x of t. It doesn't depend on x of t minus 1 or x of t minus 2 and so on. Okay. So this system is actually memoryless. Let's look at another example. Here we have the integrator. The integrator has a system that looks something like this. Y of t equals the integral of x of tau. Remember, the domain of integration is different. d tau minus infinity to t. Okay. Now, if I look at this system, clearly the output y of t is going to depend on summing up other values of uh, x other than just x of t. right? And therefore, this system would indeed have memory. It is also useful to study whether a system is invertible. Okay. Uh, just as a quick aside, for many problems in science and engineering, we will actually be interested in uh, inverting systems. So as a side note, We often deal with systems that are of this form. I might have, uh, let's say a traffic, let's say I have this car that is speeding through an intersection. Here's the traffic light, okay? It's speeding through the intersection. If I have a camera that takes a photo of the car, the car is actually gonna be very blurry. I'm actually gonna get a very blurry version of the car it might look something like this. It looks like a blurry version of the car. So the camera, the motion of the car and the camera is a system. If this is the ground truth signal x of t that I want, well, that signal has gone and been warped by the camera and the motion thereof. You have s of x of t, which has given you that blurry uh, you know, version of the car, which is now y of t. So given y of t, you want to given some properties that you know of the system, you want to actually go back and estimate x of t. And in order to do that, you want to have a system that is invertible. So in this particular example, if we look at this equation, x equals s inverse times s of x, that's also tantamount to saying that uh, if I take, uh, let's say, y, which is my measurement, and then I apply the inverse system to y, then I'm actually going to end up just getting an estimate of x. So this is a useful property of systems where I can actually invert them uh, because many systems are not good for signals. We talked about some examples like radar where you're amplifying a signal, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the system is some sort of noise or corruption to your data. In this particular case, the blurring of a fast moving car. And you wanna actually undo the damage a system has done and you want to find ways to invert a system. So that's the practical use case of understanding how to invert systems. Now, if we could invert every system in the world, we could almost solve every science and engineering problem, right? Uh, because they all come down to signals and systems. 
if I want to estimate the stock market, right, the stock market is itself a sequence of signals that are being operated on by market forces, which are a system. So if I can learn more about that interplay between systems and signals, I could solve the stock market. Now, the problem with this is that it's actually very hard to invert systems. Not all systems can be inverted. So let's go through some examples. Here is the squaring system, right? The squaring system, which was something like y of t equals x of t squared. So that's the squaring system. Now, the question for you as a check your understanding is, is this system invertible? Okay. And I'm just going to put another system here the differentiator system, which is y of t dt, and maybe a scalar multiplier. So that'd be y of t equals a times x of t for some a that's not equal to zero. So as a check your understanding, Please answer, what are these three systems here? One, two, three. What are these three systems here are indeed invertible or not? Feel free to pause the video and rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So if I look at the first system, the squaring, I can kind of see that this system is not invertible, right? If you're squaring a signal, um, if I measure the square of x, I don't actually know the right real value of x, right? Because we can't recover the sign. For example, if x squared is 9, I, I don't know if x is 3 or minus 3. So this system is not invertible. because we cannot recover the sign. Okay, let's look at the second system, the differentiator. Is this invertible? Well, this one is also not invertible. You know, because you might have some, sig you know, some other candidate signal, x tilde of t, and that can equal the real solution x of t plus some constant c. So, because this x tilde of t has the same derivative as my real solution x of t. Okay. Let's look at the last example, the scalar. The answer here is just simply yes. Yes, because you can find x of t uniquely by just solving algebra. And remember that a was constrained to be not equal to zero. In general, there are analytical tests to ascertain whether a system is indeed invertible or not. Some of the techniques we may discuss in this class, others are deferred to graduate courses. Invertibility, stability, and memory of systems are advanced properties. So know what they are, but really focus on being able to analytically show linearity and time invariance first before moving on to these other concepts. Okay, let's go through a check your understanding question. This, as I mentioned, invertibility is not super easy. Um, so we're gonna kind of ask a challenge question that links linearity and invertibility, right? So this is uh, not super easy. It's not an easy question. So suppose, there exists a system S, okay, where S is linear. So I have a linear system S, and this system also has an inverse. So it seems like a pretty well-behaved system. It's a system that is linear, and it has an inverse. Now, the question that I'm going to ask you, so the question 
is S inverse linear, right? If, the, if a system S is linear, does its inverse necessarily need to be linear? Okay. Here, you're going to assume, just for mathematical co to cover our basis, we'll just assume that X is in the domain of S inverse. And likewise, S inverse of X So feel free to pause the video and see if you can end up solving this. Okay, welcome back. So the first step to solve this is to kind of repose this in ways that we understand. So let's start with some facts. We know that S is linear, therefore S of AX plus BX tilde is gonna equal AS of X plus B S of X tilde, right? This just follows from the definition of linearity. We also know because S has an inverse, we know that X is gonna equal S inverse times S of X. Okay, so these are some preliminary facts. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that S inverse itself is a linear system. Okay. So our goal, I'll just write it in purple because I'm going to erase it soon. Our goal is to show that S inverse of AX plus BX tilde equals AS inverse of X plus BS inverse of X tilde. Okay. It should be clear that this is our goal that we'll want to show uh, from this. Now, how would we get there? Well, our first step to get to this goal is to realize that we can rewrite this system as follows. Okay. It's completely fair to go ahead and write the system as something like S of some scalar A as inverse of X plus B as inverse of X tilde. Okay. It's completely fair to go ahead and write the system like this. Why? Because if I can write it like this, this is a valid input to my system. And you can now apply the property of linearity to go and recast this as A S of S inverse of X plus B S S inverse of X tilde. Now, now that I've written it in this way, what is this equal to? Well, remember that S of S inverse of X is nothing but X. So I can go ahead and rewrite this as simply AX plus BX tilde. If any of the steps don't make sense, feel free to pause the video and kind of digest them. So now what I want to show, right? Remember that my goal, if I bring back my goal in purple, I want to show that S inverse
equals the linear expansion. Right, that was my goal from the outset. So here I have ax plus bx, here I have ax plus bx, so I can simply substitute. I can simply substitute, so I have S inverse of So I've just substituted my expression for ax plus bx tilde. So the reason we kind of wrote this expression out was because we wanted to find a way to express the argument of the s inverse in my goal, shown right here, in a way that included also s. So now, as you can see, I can simply simplify this to a s inverse of x. plus b s inverse of x tilde. Okay. So just convince yourself that this is true. And therefore, because remember, so now we have shown that s inverse of ax tilde plus bx tilde equals this which equals this. So therefore, S inverse AX plus BX tilde is going to equal A S inverse of X plus B S inverse of X tilde. So I'm just going to combine this equality and this equality here. And if I look at this, this is exactly what me, what, what I mean for showing that S inverse is linear. This is the only criteria that we need to show that S inverse is indeed linear. So the answer is that in this particular case, S inverse is linear. Okay, now we're gonna move on to a very important topic. So we have discussed systems within you know, some level of detail, and now we're gonna change the conversation around to discuss a very specific type of signals and systems situation known as the impulse response. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start with sort of a top-down view of what's happening so that we don't get lost in the weeds immediately. One of the hallmarks of this class, which you'll hear about, is let's suppose there exists a, a system S that is LTI. Okay, LTI system S. What this means is that the system S is linear and time invariant. It turns out that if these two properties are yes, then the system S is a very good system for mathematical analysis. It makes our mathematical analysis easy as we'll see in this lecture and the next. And what that enables us to do is that it enables us to analyze and characterize the system based on its response to only one particular function. Okay. So remember that a system, in the general sense, you have some signal x, which goes into s, that gives you an output y. So in order for you to uh, be able to go from x to s to y, so, so if I ask you, let's say you're an engineer at a company, and you get asked by your boss, right? So your boss asks you, You know, he says, here's your, your signal X. This is the signal that is the ground truth that we as a company really want. That signal X could be something like a sharp image of a 3D scene so that cars can navigate, like a LiDAR or something like that, right? So you want a sharp X. So your boss asks you for a sharp X, but you know that that's not possible because once your device measures X, it goes through some system. 
This could be, for example, like we talked about the blurring, right? Like a blurry lens, and it gives you Y. So now the question is, given uh, some examples of X, so if I give you some examples of X, example one, like this could be a LIDAR scene. Here I have a tree, you know, predict to me how that would blur. Well, it would look something like this, I guess, right? Here I have a car scene. I take a picture on the highway and I see other cars, right? Uh, here I take a picture of a mountain and I see a mountain, right? So I'm going to have here a blurry mountain. Here I'm going to have a blurry car. So now the magic is that if, if the system S, if it was LSI, then LTI in this case, LTI, then you could actually go and predict what the output would be for any given input. So you could always tell your boss how the output is going to look, and that's going to be a big factor in generating sharp images in the future. Okay. If this doesn't make sense right now, don't worry about it too much. We'll start again with the mathematical tools and then build up from there. All right. Now, in general, the impulse response is a tool that enables us to calculate the output of a system with respect to any input. So as we spoke on the previous slide, the goal here is in general, if I'm given a system, calculate sub t. So there's a couple ways we can do this, right? We talked about examples in the class, like class examples. You know, I told you the squaring function, the squaring system, right? Y of t equals x of t squared. So in this particular case, this is good, you know, because I can take any x of t, I can square it, and I can calculate the output for your system. Now, unfortunately, in real life, is not like classes in real life, we may not know much about S. Indeed, if we knew S, then all these problems would be, become trivial. But in reality, we have some data X that goes into a black box. Right? This is my sharp image. It goes into a black box. to give me why. In the examples of like the cars that we've talked about, like the self-driving cars, you take your sharp image data, it goes through some system S, which, which could be very complicated. It could include software processing, optical physics, like how does the light from the world go and reflect off the dust in the lens? How does the camera sensor go and add noise? So on and so forth. And of course, I could try to model model that analytically, I could try to, to, to get it here in category one for the car example by understanding the physics of how dust scatters light and you know so on and so forth. But that becomes a very, very time consuming exercise that's very difficult to predict with any type of realism. So sometimes it makes a lot more sense to just say, you know what, I used to have a sharp image, but then it went through my optics and processing on the car and now it's given me a blurry image Y. Okay, what do I do? So what happens when S is very complicated, right? Sadly, S is usually very complicated. So this is one of the magical ideas of the class. So the magical solution here is that if I know the black box output for one specific function,
So the magical solution of this class is that if I knew the black box output for one specific function, that is, if I know how the system is going to respond with a delta, then I can calculate the output for any x of t. It's kind of really hard to show how magical this, this fact is, right? I used to, if I could not do this, I need to hire like a hundred optical scientists in my self-driving car example to go and tell me how every piece of dust or noise or sensor artifacts is going to manipulate my output. And this function, this complicated function, may vary for different devices as well, different types of cars, manufacturers, or even different products. But if I know how the system responds to one calibration function, so I can do a one-time calibration by sending a delta into the system, then that tells me everything I need to know about the system if the system is LTI. I don't need to know anything else about the system. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about systems as a response to different types of inputs. So for example, there are several special systems characterized by functional response. For example, you might have a system that has a zero response. So let's write our system in this particular slide, not as H, but we'll write it as, uh, not, not as S, but as H. So the zero response of a system is H of zero, right? I put zero into H and I get out something, right? So I have here, I have X going into H, that gives me Y. So the zero response is as if I had put in zero here. Another system that is very useful is the impulse response. Okay. That is H of delta of T. Other useful systems include the step response system. How does your system respond to an edge? So as a quick COIU, this is kind of like a quick hit. If H is linear, what is the zero response? Okay. Well, the zero response, remember, is nothing but h of 0. Therefore, if you look at h of 0, we can also write that h of 0 equals h of 0 times x of t. This equals 0 times x of t. And this equals 0. So we got from this equality to this one by using the linearity property. So if the system is linear, it has a zero response that is equal to zero. Okay, now having talked about the zero response, let us dive a little bit more into detail on the impulse response. Let H be a system. Okay. And Y of T equals H of X of T. The impulse response is
So what I'm doing is I'm sending an impulse that's some time tau and measuring the output of h, h of t comma tau. This will become more clear on the following slides. So let me just write the intuition here. We send Okay, uh, it looks like my screen share of the iPad has frozen for the moment. Let me see if I can get back to it. Okay, so this is back to my email. All right, so here's our impulse response definition. Let me just go up and go to the past two slides. I'll just review them. So we had this slide. The magic is that if I know the black box output for one specific function, x of t equals delta t, then I can calculate the output for any x of t if s is LTI. Here, we talked about a few different types of responses, the zero response, the impulse response, and the step function response. And we had a quick checker understanding question. If h is linear, what is the zero response? Since the zero response is h of zero, we can just use algebra here. h of zero is nothing but h of zero times x of t, which equals zero times h of x comma t equals zero. Okay, so that's how we solve that check your understanding question. Here, we are just going through the definition of impulse response. Let h be a system and y of t equals h of x of t. So the impulse response is h of t comma tau equals capital H of the delta. So the intuition here, right, the intuition is to send an impulse at time tau, and the output of h is then h of t comma tau. So let me draw this for the moment. Here's the signal, here's my time axis, and I have in red here, delta of t. Now I take this and I put it in to a system h and this gives me some sort of response. So here's my axis. Here I have time. I don't know, something like this. And this might be at time two. So this would be h of two comma zero because this function in general here is h of t comma zero. Yeah, it's the blue function in general. Now, this is the typical form for an impulse uh, response system. I'm gonna send a delta in the delta can be a time tau or it could be kind of at any time. And I'm gonna get an output, uh, which is also indexed in a time kind of notation. As you'll see on the next slide, there is a little bit of a nuance, a subtlety to the notation on time, okay? Notation of time. The notation for t. So there are a few important things if we look at this system that we drew on the previous slide. I'm going to send in a delta that's centered at some coordinate tau, right? In the previous slide, it was centered around tau equals zero. So this example here is at tau equals zero. So um, in general, the delta could have been centered anywhere, right? I could have also gotten an impulse response if I had chosen to shoot off a delta here at some other uh, time step, uh, at some shift tau. So in general, the input to the system can be delta of t minus tau. So I have delta of t minus tau going into h, and my output of that is lowercase h of some variable t comma tau. So the t on the left hand and right hand side of these equations are not identical, right? The t on the left hand side is the output's impulse response at a specific time value. 
the t on the right hand side actually varies across all time. It's just a property of how we write the Dirac delta function notation. So therefore, the output on the left-hand side at one specific timestamp, like h of 2 comma 0, is going to depend on the input at multiple times t on the right-hand side. So I'm going to go through a few examples of this just to make it clear on the next few slides. So for now, please just bear with me. Okay, so here's an example of the t is not being the same. Once again, I have my same equation that we've talked about here. In this example, let's suppose that I'm going to send up a Dirac at zero delay. So therefore, time tau, the time shift tau, is going to be zero. So therefore, the delta will be spiking up uh, right at the origin, which you see right over here. Okay. Now, if that goes into my input, I might get, as the output, a system that looks like this. This is my output system. Now, it may be tempting to write down something like h of 1 comma 0 equals h of delta comma 1. Right? Remember that if tau equals 0, then it's mathematically very tempting to write down, so remember it's h of t comma 0 equals h, capital H, of delta of t. So it might be very tempting to therefore say that set t equal to 1. And therefore, you write h of 1 comma 0 equals h of delta of 1. Okay. So the question is, is this right or wrong? Right? Is this right or wrong? Is this fair to write? Well, because my times are not equal on the left-hand side and right-hand side of the equation, I actually can't write this. And so you can actually see from the form of the equation that this doesn't really make sense, right? If you look at, let's look at lowercase, let's look at this portion right here, h of 1 comma 0. That's some value here. I don't know what the value is. Maybe it's 0 0.3. Who knows what that value is, right? So it's like 0 0.3 or some non-zero value. And let's look at what delta of 1 is. Delta of 1 is right here, which is 0. Okay. So this equation doesn't work if you treat the time axes as the same. So this is not correct. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the time invariant impulse response. So suppose that I have some h of t comma tau as being equal to capital H of delta of t minus tau. Therefore, if I suppose that I'm going to send a Dirac that is centered around the zero origin, centered around the origin, if tau equals zero, I'm going to have h of t comma zero equals h of delta of t. Okay, so this is one particular shift. Now, if h is time invariant, so if h is a time invariant system, so suppose h Then I can write down h of delta of t minus tau equals lowercase h of t minus tau comma 0. Right? And in this particular case, this is going to equal h of t comma tau. Just by our definition, of shift invariance. So in summary, 
if h is time invariant. then h of t equals capital H of delta of t and h of t minus tau shifted version of the impulse response is going to equal a shifted version of the input to the impulse response, which should be a shifted delta function. So graphically, this is kind of what it might look like. So I have my two axes. And so here, I'm going to have one Dirac in blue. And I'm going to send another Dirac into my system here at some shift, t minus tau. Now I'm going to send both of these into my system h. which is time invariant, right? This has to be time invariant. And I'm going to get an output, which looks something like this. So the blue Dirac might have, just using the notation that we had before, we had some curve that looks something like this. And the purple Dirac is going to produce an output to the system that is the same curve that is just shifted by tau units. So this shift here is tau. So this is showing a version of a system that is time invariant and how that modifies the time invariant impulse response. One way to think about it is if I have a microphone, right, that's recording music, the microphone to calibrate it, what I'll often do is I'll often snap my finger. I'll snap my finger, or you may have seen in the movies, they have this, like, when they start a scene, they have this, like, plaque, and then they have this kind of lever that you go and drop to make a clack on that. It's kind of like a sound in Hollywood. It's, it's one of the symbols of Hollywood. So if I have something making a sound like that, it's a, it's a sharp, localized spike in time, right? Everything is quiet. So imagine, I'm going to kind of shut up for now, right? So everything is going to be quiet. And then it's quiet, right? That kind of signal, if you look at the sound wave, it kind of is like everything is zero, then I've clapped and it's high, and then it's zero again. Now, this is very interesting for microphones because if I send the signal into a microphone and I have, a, I have kind of like a junky microphone, if the microphone is low quality, then it's gonna actually come out as a muffled sound that, that is very, like has a lot of echoes and reverb, right? Now, that's the impulse response. The key is that if I do this again, if I do this experiment again, and so now I've done two claps, so I kind of have sent two spikes, sort of like what we're talking about, the response for each spike should be exactly the same, except that their responses should just be shifted by tau. That's what we mean by having a time invariant impulse response. So this sounds like it should be obvious, but you'll see that actually many real world systems are not like this. For example, uh, a microphone that somebody has built is usually really, really good, right? By now we've mastered, humans have mastered the art of building microphones. But back in the day, microphones and cameras and similar actually were very sensitive to temperature fluctuations. So if I sent a spike in once, and then maybe I waited for a longer time and the temperature got warmer, it became like late afternoon, now the camera is heated up. When I send my second spike, I might get a different shape of the curve. So that's just an intuition for when things are time invariant and when things are not. Okay. So now let me continue with a very specific fact about the impulse response. Okay, so the fact is 
if H is an LTI system with some impulse response, H of T equals capital H of delta, then we can calculate the output for any X of T if we know H of T. So this is a very, very important result. Okay. That's something we alluded to earlier in the sense that if I replay the microphone example again, in the microphone example, what I'm doing is, so here's my microphone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the microphone by putting in a Dirac to it. Right, so that could be somebody clapping their hands. And I'm going to get an output. The microphone might output a signal that looks kind of like this, some sort of wonky decaying signal. Okay. It's got a lot of reverb and maybe it has some oscillations. These are echoes. Okay. So it turns out that this is H of T. Here I've put in a Dirac delta of T. This is my system H. It turns out that if I know H of T for the microphone and the system is indeed linear and time invariant, then I could have any type of singer in the world. Like it could be, I don't know, Justin Bieber or um, you know, Andrea Bocelli or similar. There, there's, I can predict how they would sound in this microphone okay. for any song or voice that goes in just by having this one calibration function of a clap. So now we're going to sort of to really underscore that intuition. We're going to derive that. So the, it turns out that, remember, we can write x of t. We, in a previous lecture, we talked about the Dirac and sifting. And we kind of did something really counterintuitive where we had a function x of t and we wrote that in terms of delta of t's. That made the, the equation a little bit more clunky, but as you'll see here, it helps us derive that point above. So the approach is to derive write x of t in terms of delta of t. So here I have a signal. And I'm going to have some over here, some sort of x of tau. And I have tau. So if I have this x of tau, it turns out I can write this x of tau as a sum of Dirac's. Right? So for example, here is delta of tau. Here is the timestamp x of t, right? So this occurs at delta of tau minus t. So in order to calculate x of 0 using deltas, all we have to do is write x of tau times delta of tau, which equals x of 0 times delta of tau. And remember that if we integrate this, we get x of 0. And we can do this for any timestamp t. So we can calculate any x of t using deltas. We simply have, again, once, once again, x of tau times delta of tau minus t, which is equal to x of t times delta of tau minus t. And once again, if we take this, integrate this, now we get x of t. So therefore, we have a way to write any x of t 
in terms of deltas. But the key is we will need to integrate this expression. So let's see how this would play out. If I want to get back to x of t, then I need to go ahead and integrate from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau times delta of tau minus t d tau as being equal to minus infinity to infinity x of t delta of tau minus t d tau. And this is equal to taking x of t out of the integral, right? Because the integral is over tau. Integral of minus infinity to infinity of the delta of tau minus t d tau. And this is equal to x of t. Because remember, the integral of a delta function is equal to 1. Therefore, we can summarize as follows. So in summary, x of t equals the integral of x of tau delta of tau minus t d tau. And remember, just by the properties of delta, right? you can uh, remember that the Dirac delta function uh, is uh, even function. So you have minus infinity to infinity of x of tau delta of t minus tau d tau. OK, this equation here is known by a specific integral name. It's a very common integral as the convolutional integral. OK. So let me go to the next slide here. Let me actually add a piece of paper. Let's see how I add a new page. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to add a new page, so I bear with me. Uh, plus sign. Paper. Hmm. OK, so I'm having trouble adding a new page. But I want to make sure that you guys have this page for your annotated lecture notes. It must be an easy way to add a page here. Oh, add page is perfect. All right. So let me expand now on the convolutional integral. In a more general sense, we can apply a similar idea for the impulse response as before, 
showing that any function is going to be represented, any systems output that is LTI can be represented in terms of the impulse response. So let me first go with our goal. Our goal is that I have a system, capital H, where I have gone and put in some sort of function x of signal x of t, and I'm, I've gotten spit out y of t. So the goal is to write y of t in terms of x of t. Now, we were doing this before in the class, where I remember I had that example of the squaring system, right? But the problem here is that I don't know a general form for how to write this until now. So now I'm gonna show you that we can use the tools that we have discovered previously in class to actually write down y of t in terms of x of t for any x of t, assuming that the system is LTI. So this is a very, very powerful tool. So let's start by just writing the first line of the equation, right? The first line would be, well, y of t, is going to equal h of x of t. So that's one general way to write it. Okay. But I don't know what capital H is. So what I can do is I can plug in my previous expression to simplify this. So let's put an h. And then remember, x of t is minus infinity to infinity of x of tau delta of t minus tau d tau. That just follows from the previous slide. Now, if I look at this system, remember when I write capital H, that means that the system is lin linear and time invariant. So now I'm going to apply linearity to this. And if I apply linearity, I'm going to get something that looks like the following. I'm going to get the integral of minus infinity to infinity of x of tau h of delta of t minus tau d tau. Now remember that this portion here had a special name. This portion is the impulse response. So now what I'm doing is in every step of the integral, right? If I look at every step of the integral, every different value of tau that I integrate over, I'm computing h of delta. Now, no matter what the value of tau is, remember that the system is time invariant. So I can apply time invariance So I can apply time invariance now to simplify this equation to integral of minus infinity to infinity x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. And so what this is saying, this particular form is something that is known as convolution. What it's saying is that y of t is always equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. And this is known as the convolution integral. Okay. So now our goal has been achieved. We have been able to write down y of t in terms of x of t. This expression can also be written in shorthand as y of t equals some function x of t star h of t. So the star signifies convolution and not multiplication, not standard multiplication. In the next lecture, 
we will go over an intuition of how convolution works and go through some examples of computing the impulse response. Thanks for your attention.